Hello and welcome to New Frontiers on CCTV International. I'm Jia Jun in Beijing. In today's program, we are continuing with our major series about Chinese kung fu. Now, a term that's often used in kung fu circles is Nan Chuan Beishui. Essentially, this means boxing in the south and kicking in the north. The two quite distinct martial arts styles described by Nan Chuan Beishui have a lot to do with the different physical characteristics of people living north and south of the Yangtze River. Roughly speaking, people in the north tend to be big and heavy, while their counterparts in the south are smaller and more delicate. Nan Xuan or Southern Style Boxing is a general term for the various martial arts schools that have become popular in the south of China. Nan Xuan features steady strikes with the hands delivered with sudden explosive force. Although that's not to say that certain techniques haven't been borrowed from the north. In Ming Dynasty era documents, Qi Ji Guang is often compared to a fierce tiger from the north, while Yu Dayou is compared to a fierce dragon from the south. Yu Dayou, a native of Zhuanzhou in Fujian province, was learned in both civil and military affairs, and the reputation he enjoyed was as great as Qi Ji Guang. Yu Dayou was a martial arts master whose skills were of the highest level. The difference between Qi Ji Guang and Yu Dayou lies in the fact that Yu Dayou displayed the courage of a lone chivalrous man. On one occasion, when his army was dispatched to suppress bandits in Guangxi province, he and several of his deputies entered the bandits' den in an attempt to persuade them to surrender. When the bandits refused, Yu Dayou suggested to the bandit chiefs that they discuss martial arts with him, and they agreed. As soon as Yu Dayou demonstrated his skill with the cudgel, the bandits were so astounded they agreed to surrender on the spot. This is a demonstration of Yu Dayo's cudgel, a routine that is still practiced in Yu Dayo's hometown. At 1.7 meters in length, the cudgel is so long it reaches the brow of the practitioner, and so it is also known as the brow high cudgel. In combat, the user can swing the cudgel around and use it to hack and stab, and the movement should be made with energy generated through regulated breathing. The routine is, in fact, the most classic of all the cudgel styles practiced in southeast China. The Yu Dayo's cudgel routine was already famous when Yu Dayo was still alive, and Qi Ji Guang thought so highly of it. He described it in detail in his book Discipline and Efficiency, and he made it a compulsory routine for the soldiers under his command. Hu Liangchen, another military strategist of the Ming Dynasty, writes in his book Tactical Deployment of Troops, Yu Dayo's cudgel has reached a level that cannot be reached by any other routine. But martial arts researchers have not yet been able to reach a consensus on the origin of Yu Dayo's cudgel. Some of them hold that Yu Dayo's cudgel evolved from the Taizu cudgel routine created by Emperor Taizu of the Song Dynasty. If so, Yu Dayo's cudgel would have its source in North China. However, a folktale told in Chuanzhou in the south claims that Zhao Kuangyin or Emperor Taizu was a great martial arts master, and that he developed both Taizu's longboxing and Taizu's cudgel, and that he taught them only to children of the royal family. This version of the origins of Yu Dayo's cudgel claims that when the Northern Song Dynasty fell and descendants of the royal family fled to southeast China, some of them settled in Chuanzhou in the southern part of Fujian province, and that it was they who brought the royal family cudgel style to the southern part of Fujian province. Furthermore, when Yu Dayo was a teenager, he had a teacher who was a descendant of the royal family, 
and he taught Yu Da Yo Taizu's cudgel. Yu Da Yo then enriched the original cudgel style with features of his own devising. But others hold a different view, and this one is perhaps closer to reality. This explanation of the origins of Yu Dayo's cudgel sees Yu Dayo developing his cudgel style by integrating swordplay skills with Shaolin cudgel skills. Evidence for this theory can be found in a Ming Dynasty book called Merits of Master Yu Dayo, as well as local annals. Historical records reveal that Yu Dayo had a teacher named Li Liangqin, a man from southern Fujian province who happened to be a great master of the cudgel. It was then Li Liangqin who taught Yu Dayo to master the cudgel in a routine that went by the name Long Sword of Jing Chu. It is said this cudgel style includes sword skills and moves that are unique to Shaolin cudgel routines. The text of the manual Classic of the Sword is simple, and most of it is written in the form of rhymes. The entire text consists of just 10,000 Chinese characters, but it is a concise and valuable summary of experience gained in real combat situations. The tips in the manual include, strike late, but be the first to strike the opponent, go along with the opponent's moves and make use of his force, and let the first strike pass for a while before making the second strike. These tips are still followed by martial arts instructors today. Yu Dayo's Classic of the Sword is made up of just three chapters, devoted in turn to the sword, archery, and troop deployment. But the cream of the chapters is the chapter on the sword. Here, the term sword means the cudgel, and we learn that Yu Dayo holds that mastering the cudgel is the foundation for the mastery of all long weapons. He even compares cudgel skills to Confucian teaching, stating, the weapons, the hook, sword, spear, and rake are like the five classics in the four books. When one can understand the four books, one will find it easy to understand the other classics. In the practice of martial arts, if one can master cudgel skills, when one handles other weapons, it will seem easy. General Yu Dayo, although trained in the Southern School of Martial Arts, developed a keen interest to the Shaolin martial arts practiced in the North. He was particularly interested in the cudgel fighting techniques. He even traveled to Shaolin on a personal pilgrimage. But he would be deeply disappointed when he finally reached his destination to discover that the authentic Shaolin cudgel techniques had been lost long before. In March of the year 1536, Yu Dayo led his army from North China to Southeast China. On his way, he passed Mount Song, and he stopped there to visit his reverend Xiao Shan, the abbot of Shaolin Temple, to ask the Buddhist monk if he could watch a demonstration of genuine Shaolin cudgel technique. As Yu Dayo was known to his reverend Xiao Shan by reputation, the abbot gathered all the monks who were well skilled in the cudgel together to provide Yu Dayo with a demonstration. But Yu Dayo was disappointed. He realized that while the monk's skills were indeed impressive, they had lost their combat value. He then took off his long robe, picked up a cudgel and began to demonstrate all the moves of his long sword of Jingju cudgel style. The Buddhist monks had never seen such a ferocious cudgel technique and they all cheered. Monk Shaoshan realized that Shaolin cudgel technique had degenerated due to not having been used in real combat situations for a long time. He decided then to have a number of his monks learn cudgel skills from Yu Dayo so that the essence of Shaolin cudgel technique could be restored. But the abbot was well aware that it would be impossible to acquire the skills within just a few days, and so when Yu Dayo left, his reverend Shaoshan sent two monks with him so they could learn his cudgel techniques. After three years in the army in real combat situations under Yu Dayo's command, 
The two Buddhist monks had learned everything they needed, and so they returned to Shaolin Temple and passed on the skills to the other monks. As a result, Yudayo's cudgel was passed down from one generation to another, and today, all the books on martial arts published by Shaolin Temple list Yudayo's cudgel as a compulsory course. The story of how Yudayo revitalized Shaolin cudgel technique went on to be told time and again as an example of the exchange of martial arts techniques between North and South China. Many stories about southern style boxing claim that a fire in Shaolin Temple led to the development of the style. In the history of southern style boxing, the mystery of the fire of Shaolin Temple is the most difficult to unravel, as no evidence has ever been found of any such fire. During the Qing Dynasty, various fabricated stories about the burning of Shaolin Temple aroused great interest in learning southern style boxing. And as a result, many branches of this style of boxing, including pictographic boxing and other complex technical systems, appeared, and these have been passed down to the present day. But is the legendary burning of Shaolin Temple something that actually occurred? And if so, why did such an event enable southern style boxing to thrive during the Qing Dynasty? Toward the end of the Ming Dynasty and the beginning of the Qing Dynasty, Southern style boxing prospered dramatically and many new branches of Southern style boxing appeared. The number of practitioners worthy enough to have their names included in the historic record numbered into the hundreds. But how was Southern style boxing able to become so popular during the Qing Dynasty? The sudden popularity was caused by news of a fire that was said to have been deliberately set at Shaolin Temple with the intention of burning it down. This event was elaborated into a mysterious story that was soon on the lips of virtually everyone. The commonly told version of what happened goes as follows. During the reign of Emperor Kangxi of the Qing Dynasty, a small state known as Shi Lu rose in revolt, and the imperial court sent troops to suppress it several times to no avail. The Imperial Court announced that it would give the title of Marquis and an award of 10,000 taels of gold to any person who could put down the rebellion. The Buddhist monks of Shaolin Temple responded to the call and marched to the front line, and after just one battle, defeated the rebels and thus quelled the rebellion. Emperor Kangxi cited the monks for their great achievement, and Shaolin Temple gained a high reputation for the martial arts skills of its monks. But soon after this, a malevolent court minister told the emperor that the Shaolin Temple monks were practicing martial arts every day to prepare for a chance to overthrow the Qing Dynasty. Emperor Kangxi was furious, and he responded by dispatching 3,000 troops to Songshan Mountain to burn down Shaolin Temple. And of the several hundred monks there, only five escaped death in the fire. The five survivors fled to southern Shaolin Temple in Zhuangzhou and Fujian province, and there they became known as the five forerunners of Shaolin martial arts. The five monks brought together the skills they already had and the martial arts skills of various local practitioners, and eventually they developed Wu Zhu boxing or five forerunner boxing. The new style quickly took root in Fujian and went on to become the most important boxing style in the region. Over time, many branches of southern style boxing developed on the basis of this southern Shaolin boxing. This is the legendary story of the burning of Shaolin Temple and the founding of Wuzu Boxing. The story of the burning of Shaolin Temple and the development of southern Shaolin boxing has been made into numerous movies and television dramas fans of Kung Fu talk about it with great relish. But the story has long been the subject of doubts from historians. For a start, no reference to the state of Shi Lu, which supposedly rose in rebellion against the Qing Dynasty, has ever been found in any official documents, and nor is there any mention of the tragic fire at Shaolin Temple. Did the fire ever happen? If not, then what was it that set in motion the great spread of southern-style boxing?
The Buddhist monks of Shaolin Temple in Quanzhou have preserved Wu Zhu boxing in its original form, and so perhaps it might be possible to find in it elements of Shaolin boxing as practiced in the north. So 五组 boxing utilizes many movements that are as powerful as those seen in the Shaolin boxing of the Northern School. And even the names of the five parts that comprise Wu Zhu boxing can be found in Northern style Shaolin boxing. But is it true that the five founders of Wu Zhu boxing were Buddhist monks who escaped the burning of Shaolin Temple? The names of these people give away the true origins of Shaolin Wu Zhu boxing. In folk tales told in the southern part of Fujian province, the founders of Wu Zhu boxing are Tai De Zhong, Fang Da Hong, Ma Chao Xing, He Du Di, and Li Se Kai. But these names do not appear in the archives of Shaolin Temple on Songshan Mountain. They are found, however, in the membership lists of a number of secret societies. On the membership list of the Tian Di Society, also known as Hung Men, are the five founders of the new secret society, and they are ranked in the third grade. The famous Chinese national heroes Zhang Changgong and Xue Kuofa, and the famous character Chen Jinnan, who appears in Kung Fu stories, are listed top in the society's seating order. So what was the relationship between the Tian Di Society and Shaolin Temple? During the Ming and Qing dynasties, secret societies were popular among the common people, and the membership of these societies expanded under the guise of enrolling martial arts students. The book Questions and Answers of Hong Men contains the following. Which place has the best martial arts skills? Shaolin Temple. The monks of Shaolin Temple are known throughout the world for their vigorous martial arts skills. It seems highly plausible then that as Shaolin Temple enjoyed such a great reputation, the secret society simply made up the story about the burning of Shaolin Temple during the Qing Dynasty to link themselves with the temple. Shaolin Temple was and still is a shrine for practitioners of Chinese martial arts. And knowing this, the secret societies invented the story of a fire burning down Shaolin Temple to arouse antagonism against the imperial court and win sympathy from the people. It was under these circumstances that southern style boxing acquired its opportunity to expand its influence in such a phenomenal way. In the mid Qing Dynasty, forms of boxing that were native to Fujian and Guangdong provinces began to flourish. At the same time, new, somewhat more pictographic forms such as cream boxing appeared. Such developments were a sign that southern style boxing had rid itself of the northern influence and it was developing in its own right. White crane boxing, devised by local martial arts masters in Fujian province, is acclaimed as the essence of pictographic boxing forms of southern style boxing. But in point of fact, this ferocious style was developed by a delicate young woman. Crane boxing is still practiced in Yongchun County, Fujian province today. The Yongchun White Crane Martial Arts School 
is housed in an ancestral temple built during the Qing Dynasty. Like many other martial arts schools south of the Yangtze River, in its front hall, the school has memorial tablets honoring the three founders of White Crane Boxing. They are Great Teacher White Crane, Lady Fang VII, and Master Fang Zhong. Folk tales told in Yongchun County say that Master Fang Zhong and his daughter Lady Fang VII were not natives of Yongchun, but itinerants who learned a living by going from place to place demonstrating martial arts. As Lady Fang VII was beautiful, she was often harassed by local hooligans. But as the father and daughter knew there was no hope of fighting so many of them all at once, they swallowed their pride and accepted the humiliation. But then one night, Lady Fang VII had a dream in which a white crane demonstrated particular moves. And in this dream, no matter what moves the girl used to fight the crane, the crane thwarted her attacks with ease. Moreover, the strikes from the crane's wings looked gentle, but the girl could feel their tremendous force. The next day, the girl tried the moves for herself, and in no time at all, she had developed a totally new and unique boxing form. The next time she was harassed by the hooligans, she defeated them easily. This folktale, popular among martial arts practitioners in Fujian province, claims that Lady Fang VII came up with white crane boxing after receiving guidance from an immortal white crane. And so for this reason, practitioners of white crane boxing worship the white crane as their ancestor. It is further told that Lady Fang VII settled in Yongchun and passed on her skills to her children and neighbors. This enabled white crane boxing to take root in the town and spread from there. Like many famous stories about martial arts, this story emphasizes the combination of hard and gentle forces. And this is the real essence of boxing technique. The key aim of white crane boxing is to execute a gentle but firm strike. At the same time, the practitioner should breathe as gently as a crane. The new boxing form stimulated great enthusiasm among martial arts practitioners to study southern style boxing in greater depth. In the latter period of the Qing dynasty, white crane boxing was taken from Yongchun into the area around Fuzhou and there local martial arts practitioners elaborated on it further and developed four branches. These branches are following the crane, the singing crane, the flying crane, and the feeding crane. This is a demonstration of the singing crane, the most popular branch of white crane boxing practiced in Fuzhou. The boxing style stresses the use of the palm. The practitioner augments his striking force with short cries like those of a crane. What results is a display of muscular beauty. <sighs> Following the crane is particularly popular in Fuqian. This form uses a unique method to apply the strength of white crane boxing. As its name tends to suggest, the most important feature of Zung crane boxing must be Zung. But people from other parts of China have no idea what the word Zung in the local Fujian dialect actually means. Many forms of martial arts have assimilated the best elements of white crane boxing. This is a demonstration in the Tangnan area of Wenzhou. Features of white crane boxing can be easily recognized in this form of boxing. The famous late Kung Fu movie star Bruce Lee demonstrated Yung Chu in boxing as it developed in Guangdong province in one of his films. His set patterns reminded martial arts practitioners of the striking moves of white crane boxing. Crane boxing was not the only kind of pictographic boxing with its origins in Fujian. There was another one too, called dog boxing.
Well, we'll hear more about dog boxing in our next program. And thank you for staying with us on today's New Frontiers. Tune in again next time when we'll have the concluding part of the story of Southern-style boxing. I'm Chi Xiaojun from CCTV International. Goodbye.